you've probably heard tell of people that claim that in uh you know a terrifying moments in their life during accidents and trauma and whatnot that their life flashes before their eyes well mine did and uh and when i saw the playback all i could think was man what a waste into a hard left curve truck going straight and all I could see was Jim uh, by this point the the front tires had hit the shoulder and it was going straight off this embankment and all I could see was Jim coming at the steering wheel and one thing about me that that uh, uh, I pride myself on. My brother, Bob, taught me how to drive and was on me for years. He was always, he was with me so much of the time, you know, my brother out on the road. And he had imparted to me just volumes of, you know, technical things that you do and don't do in a vehicle. One of the things you never do in a vehicle, especially a heavy, top-heavy vehicle like a pickup truck, is try to make uh, abrupt, violent course correction if if your two of your wheels are off the road. You never do that because you'll you'll roll the truck in the direction of the shoulder, and uh, especially if you're going any speed, and we were going about 70 kilometers, 75 kilometers an hour, I saw Jim lunging for the wheel. And I knew we were going off the road. There's no, There was no question we were leaving the highway for sure. And I was afraid that he was going to grab the wheel and jerk, try to jerk the truck back onto the pavement. And I knew if he did that, turning the front wheels hard was going to flip us right over. So I elbowed him right in the face and I hit him so hard I knocked one of his teeth out. I knocked one of his molars out in the side of his, his face and almost laid him out. And I just, I just straightened the wheel and grabbed the wheel with both hands and let her go because there was no other choice. I, I, I knew if we rolled it, we were going to die and I couldn't see all I could see in front of me were alders and spindly trees and I thought I'd rather hit those than roll over and I didn't know how deep this hole was well it was f fucking deep it was at least I don't know it had to be 40 or 50 feet deep this embankment so we left the road and all four tires were in the air and the truck started to lean over to the right side, right side, right side. And this was all happening in slow motion. It probably only took all of four or five seconds to, for this to happen. But for me, at the wheel, I thought, holy shit, this is not good. I always tell people the only reason I survived this accident because I was driving a big Chevy Silverado truck. And it's probably, it is true, right? 
If I had been driving a minivan or a car or whatever, we'd all been dead. There's no question about that in my mind. So as we're in the air, the truck's leaning over right, 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 right. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, don't, don't go over, don't go over. And at the last second, for some reason, the truck went flip right up straight. And we hit. We hit trees, a bunch of trees. And and then we we hit something, the ground, rocks. But at that point, it sh that when we hit that, it sheared all four tires and axles off the truck. Just tore the whole bottom of the truck off. And then we, at that point, the airbag went off. And the airbag hit, it was so fast, I'll never forget that. It was, all I saw was this brilliant orange light. And it hit me hard. And I was already sort of in the air, in the, in the, I was up in the, in the air when this happened. Still holding the steering wheel, which by this time I had bent. I had bent the steering wheel over about three inches. I was holding it so hard. And airbag hit me, and the airbag hit me in the belly and the thigh, the left thigh. Then I, and then it drove me back against the center console, which I struck right dead center in, with my spine. I felt it. I felt it hit, and then, the, and then we, it, that launched us into the air again, and we flew a little further through some more trees, and then we finally hit head on in into this. It, it was a driveway. It was it was made out of big gigantic granite blocks, and we hit that head on, and everything in the bed of the truck came through the rear windows. That the I had a huge equipment case back there that came forward and hit Jim's daughter in the shoulder and and broke her rotator cup. A uh, chip chip cracked it. She required surgery for it later. Um and then we and we just came to rest and when we stopped I was in the floorboards sort of. Jim was in the floorboards. The girls were screaming. The, uh, Kermit was with us, my dog, that I had actually got in Nashville on the trip I made in the last episode. And uh, she jumped out the window, the dog, and, and lost her. And so then there is just silence. And I was on the, like, underneath where the radio is wedged in there uh and i realized at that point i couldn't feel my legs and i panicked and i and i started crawling just grabbing everything i could to get up out of the floorboards and get back in the seat and i did that i'm sitting there in the seat and I'm touching my legs, and they're numb. Can't feel them. And I'm starting to try to assess what the damage is. And it was at that point that my whole life flashed before my eyes. It just was instantaneous. It really, it really honestly did. I saw my entire life just like a movie reel. It happened in a matter of, of, of seconds. And I, and I, and the first thing in my brain was, is this really how I'm going out? Because I thought to myself, if my back's broken, what what of what else is wrong, right? I could be bleeding internally. I didn't feel any pain at that point. But then then I suddenly thought, oh, you gotta check on everybody else. And I said, first thing out of my mouth was, is is everybody alive? Because it was pitch black, dark. I couldn't see anything. The headlights were gone. They had some dash lights, but it and everybody 
you know, shouted in the affirmative. Yeah, we're, and Hilda said, are you okay? And I said, I, I know I'm not. And she said, what's wrong? I said, I think my back's broken. And she, she reached around the seat to me and was kind of holding on to me. And I, and I, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, we had OnStar on the truck. It came on. Mr. Cormier, we've detected a collision. Are you all right? And I said, no, we're hurt. We're all conscious, but we're all, we're all hurt. I didn't know who was hurt. I just knew I was, but I was assuming that everybody had had some damage. Well, amazingly, we crashed. The truck came to rest right in front of a house there in the reservation where there was a woman, a, a Mi'kmaq lady who was a paramedic. She saw the wreck and literally I saw her. She jumped out her window, her bedroom window in her pajamas and started running towards the truck. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And she, she run down to the truck and uh, she checked on all of this and I lost track of her. But, but, but I mean, the cops... And the paramedics were there in in seconds, it seemed like. It was just, they just seemed to instantly show up. And so I'm still sitting there, and Jim is out of the car. He's got the other, the two girls out of the car. I'm still in the car. I, and I just lost track of them all together. I was, I was like, holy shit, uh... And I don't even know what happened to them, really. I, I'm not sure. I, and I was just there, sweating and not knowing what was going on. And by the time the Mountie got down this hill and stuck his head in Jim's door and said, have you been drinking tonight? And I looked at him and said, no, have you got one? And he he sort of laughed, and he was and he was sticking his face in there to to smell liquor on me, but he but he didn't. And so, at by this time, this horrible pain, and it's it's a it's a great it's a it's a great testament to the human body, how the body functions. Because when I when we crashed, my your brain just shuts off your body. It's just like, well, there's an injury there, so we got to shut that down. So I started, I, all of a sudden, I could feel my legs, but I also <laughs> had this pain growing in the, in the, in my lower back, way down, way down low. And it was, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I thought, oh, Jesus, here we go. But I was glad I could feel my legs again, but I couldn't really move them that much. I was, every time I tried to move, it was just searing agony. And so by this time, the ambulance showed up and about six guys, you know, most of them braves, right from the reservation. I, and I call them that with the utmost respect and the, some of them knew me, <laughs> and uh, they knew they had to get me out of the truck, so they brought a backboard down, and these were big, strong men, and I'm t I mean, I'm a big guy, but still, it was in the middle of the night, dark, wet, rocks, I mean, it's a nightmare, and they got this backboard in the, in the door and got my ass up on it, and boy, I'm telling you, those six guys had a job to get me out of that truck and onto that board because I couldn't help them. And they, I started making fun of them. I was like, I thought you guys were tough. Not the first nations were tough. What the, what the fuck, man? Can't lift a big fat white guy. Like, and everybody was starting to piss themselves laughing, right? Cause it was getting comical. And so then one of them reached down and pushed on my stomach and said, is this always like this or you, uh, you get some swelling and it, like they, the, everybody started, it was just, it was a very, actually a magical moment because nobody knew how bad I was hurt. 
and everyone was diffusing the situation with with humor, and it was beautiful. And I, and I and I and I started to feel better because we were all sort of laughing and giggling, but I was in so much pain, and they it they just about dropped me two or three times trying to get me up this hill. It was in, it was incredible the amount of strength and resilience these guys showed to get me up out of that hole and finally got me in the ambulance and the and the paramedic looked at me and he said where so what's going on and i said well when we first hit i couldn't feel my legs for quite a while i could feel them now and i i said are they moving and he's like yeah they're moving i said yeah but there's i'm in so much pain he said where's the pain i said it's it's, it's right down in the bottom of my back, like way down, just above my hips, you know, and it's killing me. And I and he, and he said, he said, well, we're going to give you some oxygen, get your oxygen topped up, and he put the tubes in my nose, and we rushed to the hospital. Uh, in Bedeck, that's where we ended up. God bless him. So they got us into the ER and. I was put in a separate room because they didn't know where the, what was wrong with me. And this nurse came in and said, so what's, and I told her what was going on. And she said, okay, well, we've got to get you to x-ray. And I couldn't move. I couldn't function. It was, the pain was so bad. I couldn't barely talk to her. And I'll never forget it. She took this big metal syringe and just stabbed me right in the thigh and it was morphine. And I'll never forget that feeling either. It was very unpleasant. It was, I felt that drug like going up my leg into my, it was just really, I didn't like it. And, and it didn't really help the pain that much. And like you're talking to somebody or, or you're listening to somebody who, I've just never used drugs. I, I don't even take aspirin at all or anything like that. I just, I've always been of the mind that if I'm in, if I'm hurting or whatever, I want to know I'm hurting, so I don't continue to damage myself by doing something that drugs are masking the problem. Right? I've always just lived with pain, and, and I was about to <laughs> embark on a journey with pain that I was wasn't expecting to. So they took me down to X-ray, and boy, when they when they got me on that, that that table, I could feel, I, I could almost hear it. I could feel something in my lower back just grinding. I could feel it. Every time they moved me, I could just feel it grind. And I was like, I said, boys, there's something really wrong. I, I can feel something loose in my back. There's something moving in there. And so, and they couldn't get a decent x-ray and they were trying and they tried and they... It took forever. They finally got a picture that they could deal with. But there was no doctor there to to read the goddamn x-ray. So they they put it online and, and, and got it sent down to my doctor in Halifax. And, of course, I would come to find out that he never got it. It, it was weeks before he... It was a couple of weeks or more before he ever got the x-rays. So nobody really knew what was going on. And so they put me back in the room and I, 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 they were like, can you sit up? Can you, can you walk? Because there's not, you're, you're no, you're no danger of dying, but, um, there was, you know, uh, can you, can you move? Cause if you can go home, you should go home, you know? and try to rest this off or go see your own doctor or whatever. Well, I couldn't get up out of the bed. I couldn't even sit up at all. So when I did, I just wanted to scream. So Jim and Hilda and, and Jim's daughter, uh, they came in and I said, boys, I, I'm not, I can't go with you. I guess I can't, can't make it. And so they left me there. Now, Jim lost a tooth, and I don't know what else happened to him. Uh, Jessie, of course, was more serious, but she didn't know at the time. But 
she they busted it cracked her rotator cup she had to have that fixed after and hilda got off scot-free some of the glass that came in the truck got in between her shin and the front of and the back of my seat and she had five or six little cuts on her leg and that was all that happened to her it was, it was, it was one of the things that's great about being small right she was and she was belted um i didn't wear seat belts because I just didn't wear them. Stupid, stupid thing. But at the same time, I'm not sure what would have happened to me if I had been wearing a belt. I sure wouldn't have broke my back. But I, I'm, it's, uh, you know, just don't know. But I'm pretty sure a seatbelt would have saved me a ton of problems. So wear your seatbelts. So there I was, and they put me in a private room which was nice. I appreciated that. They didn't have to do that, but they gave me a private room. And I don't really rem I was in there for about three days. And they were, they, I was just in so much pain that it was just un unbearable. And I couldn't lay flat. I had, so I had elevated the back of my bed up into this strange angle where the pain was the least. It was very mighty. <laughs> I remember trying to find the exact spot where I could actually sleep or sort of sleep. And, you know, they were coming in with codeine and they were coming in with Oxycontin and they were coming in with... And, I, and these drugs just made me feel like shit. It was just horrible. And it wasn't really doing much for pain so I started asking for Advil and so they were bringing me Advil in which was better and so uh I was just out of it I was out of it I couldn't I couldn't do anything I was like just taking a leak was a nightmare trying to you know couldn't really move very much and you're trying to pee in a jug in a bed and yeah, it was it was horrendous. And by the third day, the doctor came in to look at me and he said he said are you is anything getting any better? And I said no. I it's just I don't I can't move I, without screaming. And he said he said, "Well, he says I'm not sure where the break is." He says, "But you've got you you have a severe compression fa fracture somewhere in your spine." And uh, he says, there's no danger to your spinal cord. He said, but it's, it, I says, I'm not sure which, which vertebrae it's in, but you've definitely got one and it's going to cause you a lot of problems. And we've, and he said, it just, it's just going to take time. And I said to him, well, I've got to get out of here. I, at that point, I was in so much pain. I was like, just, I just want to go home and die. I don't want to die in here. I just want to, I just want to, I was just, out of my mind with it and I said listen I gotta get out of here I don't care what happens I gotta get out of here and he said well I can't let you leave until you can stand up <laughs> so that was the afternoon of the third day so that night I stayed awake all night trying to stand up without anybody finding out which was difficult I timed I timed the nurses rounds and shit and, and I literally spent all night long inching my way, you know, to, to sitting up and I'd sit up and I, I would almost pass out from the pain and I had, then I had to lay down and rest. I was sweating profusely and finally, you know, I started to get my legs out over the bed, off the edge of the bed and get sat up and that was just a horrid, horrid nightmare and lay back down you know, and catch my breath, and and finally, I got to the point where I I was well, I was afraid that if I got my feet on the floor because the bed was so high, that if I couldn't stand up, I'd just collapse on the floor. I didn't want that to happen. There was only, you know, a couple of small nurses in there. They would have never I'd have laid on the floor for the next day. So, I finally got to the point where I could get my feet on the floor. With a with. Uh, you know, a mental assurance to myself that I could get my ass back up in the bed. 
if it didn't work. So I got my feet on the floor, and it didn't work. I couldn't stand up. I tried and tried, and I'm sitting there holding on to this, you know, this tray table on wheels, which is pretty sturdy. And I was holding it, hold, trying to, get, trying. It couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. It was not going to happen. And it took me a while to get, you know, back in the bed and laid down again, and I was just exhausted. This went on all night long. Hours. I finally fell asleep. Uh, and by the way, here's something I left out. I told the doctor, I said, I got to call, I got to get it right out of here. So I got to call my buddy. I got to call Hilda. She couldn't come get me. Well, she couldn't come get me because I, I knew I couldn't fit in her car. I, w I was not going to be able to get down in the, her, she drove a Cobalt, a Chevy Cobalt. No way I was going to get in that car or out of it. So I called my buddy Morris, who had a big truck, a big Ford truck, and I said, I need you to come get me. And he said, no problem. What time? I said, 9 o'clock in the morning. So this all happened before this night of horror, trying to trying to practice getting up out of that bed. So the doctor would let me leave. And about 6 o'clock in the morning, I finally passed out and fell asleep. And nine o'clock, of course, the bell, you know, everybody starts coming in. Morris is there. Everybody's ready. The nurse wheels a wheelchair in. The doctor comes in and says, he said, if you can get out of that bed and walk to this wheelchair, I'll let you out. He said, otherwise, we're going to have to, we're going to have to transport you to Halifax because there's a problem we're not aware of. So <laughs> I said, no problem. And I sat up as fast as I could, which this whole process was like somebody was just smashing me in the back with a hatchet every time I moved. And I just, I sat up real quick and the beads of sweat started rolling off of me. I, I threw my, I tried to do it really fast to kind of just ignore the pain, right? Threw the legs over the edge of the bed, put my feet on the floor, grabbed the tray table and just went and just... I almost screamed, but didn't. Just stood stood up, fast as I could stand up, straight as an arrow. And boy, when I got up, Morris told me on the way home, he said, man, when you stood up out of that bed, your face went completely gray. All, just gray. You looked like you were dead. He said, you scared me. He said, I thought you were having a heart attack or something. And uh, I said, well, you should have you should have seen it from behind my eyes. And uh, so I'm standing there smiling like, hi, yeah, this is great. And there's just sweat fucking pouring off me. And the, it was just hilarious because the doctor just looking at me yeah, like, yeah, right. You can walk, right? He said, can you get to the chair? I said, sure. And I like shuffled over, like holding everything. And they and they they finally got me down in this chair, which was uh, it was just horrendous. And he said he just looked at me. He said, "Just go home." He said you're you're not you know. He knew I shouldn't be leaving the hospital, but there was not much that more they could do for me. So we drove, we got home. We went home. Morris drove me home, and. The trip from the truck into the house was a nightmare. I finally got into my, I had this rather large Easy Boy recliner in the living room. And luckily, it was a, like the angle of, of how it reclined, you could control. So it didn't open straight out, straight up all the way. You could change. So I, f I found that angle in that chair where there was no pain, well, little pain. And I had Hilda put a kitchen chair in front of me because that was the only way I could get up out of the chair was to grab the back of this kitchen chair and pull myself. And I was screaming every time I did this. And so I spent, this was August the 12th or 13th, uh, September, October, I spent all of August, I spent 14, 15 weeks in that chair, 15 weeks, couldn't lay down flat, that was an impossibility, 
pain was so bad I couldn't do it. I lived in that chair for 15 weeks and never did sleep in a bed for, I don't even think past that for quite some time because I just couldn't stand to lay f completely flat. Pain was too bad. A few things happened right away. Um, I finally heard from my doctor who saw the x-rays finally and so he called me up and he said, listen, you've got... He says, I found the break. He says, it's in L1. You've got a through and through compression fracture. You split the vertebrae vertically. And that's what's grinding. The two sides of your vertebrae are just grinding together. It's the biggest vertebrae in your spine. He said, that's why there's so much pain. Because you've, that's your core. All, everything that's attached to that is just screaming. And he said, he said, are you, are you laying down a lot? I said, well, I, I can't lay down straight. And he said, good, good. Because he says, you don't want to be straight because if this heel's wrong. You're never going to walk right again. And you're never going to be able to bend over. You're never going to, you gotta, you gotta have a gentle angle at your hips for this to, to turn out good. And I said, well, it's been like, the, I've been, at, I've been at a good angle ever since. He said, well, just keep doing that. And then uh, there was another problem. <laughs> there was so, there's just so many things, right? You, one of the other things that I didn't even know till I got home was that I had this, I had this humongous blood clot on my left thigh where the airbag hit me. The airbag did more damage, as much damage as saving me. It, it also, I didn't know at the time, but it also blew out my navel. I would go on to have a really bad hernia in my navel. The, the airbag hit me there and tore the muscles, which became a hernia. Also hit me in the thigh. So I had this on, it was really painful too. It was, it was this gigantic black splotch on my thigh that went from my knee almost to my groin, and it was raised up about a quarter of an inch. It was a humongous blood clot under the skin, where the bag had hit me and ruptured my thigh muscle, and. I sent a picture of it to my doctor and he said, he said, man, he said, your back isn't your worst problem. That is. And I said, why? He said, well, we, if we're lucky, uh, that entire clot is, you know, subcutaneous. Like it's, it's just under your skin. He said, if any of that, if you get unlucky and a piece of that, it, it somehow breaks off into your into your bloodstream. He said, you're, you're a dead man. And I said, oh, great. So I, I, I basically had this ticking time bomb in my leg, but I, I, I didn't, I wasn't really afraid of that. I, I just uh, somehow knew that it was just under the skin and it hurt like hell. And so there I was. Hilda, uh, just sort of, I don't know. She just distanced herself from me altogether. I, I really didn't get a lot of help from her when this was all going on. She, you know, in her classic form, tried to make a big deal out of her injuries and not mine to other people. And it was just like, Jesus, I mean, you can't see that I'm... <laughs> I can't get out of this chair. Like what, what is, what is going on? And, but at that point, it just didn't matter to me anymore. It was just like, she was going to do whatever she was going to do. And I was going to have to get through any way I could. And so, I mean, she did a few things for me. She, she fed me a few times and, but mostly I was on my own. And uh, I think maybe she was getting tired of the whole goddamn thing herself. So, you know, um, 
because the accident was caused from my stubbornness and my, also my, I just had such a work drive, a work ethic that, and I, and when I was close to home, I didn't want to sleep in some other bed. I wanted to sleep in my own bed. And I should have just stayed there that night. I was offered a free room, but I didn't want it. I, I was, I've been driving home late from gigs my entire life. I still do it now. And that, and I just ran out of luck. And I think she knew that. She knew how hard I pushed myself. And, you know, maybe she was just getting tired of the whole fucking thing too. So that's all fine and good. But it wasn't, uh, I got out of there. It was that coming weekend, about four days after I got home, that I had a gig. So here was the thing. And I know other, I've been contacted recently by some really interesting people. Uh, like, I recently got an email a few days ago from one of the co-founders of the band Rough Trade, uh, who watches this series and loves it, and, and, and is very, very nice man, wrote me a very kind letter. And... I think a lot of musicians, a lot of professional musicians who are, who, if there are any that watch this, they, they get it, right? They're the, even though some of my story seems ridiculous, how, how, how far fetched some of it is and how some of it's just ridiculous, but it is such a common story. There's, there is nothing new right? In this business, there's every artist lives through unbelievable circumstances as does all people, right? The only reason that it makes us is any different for us, which it really isn't, is that we do it in the public eye to, to whatever extent that is. It doesn't matter if you're a household name or if you know you can go to a 400-seat hall and sell it out in a, in a rural community, you're still in the public eye, and people are going to talk about you, people are going to are going to say this and that, and there's going to be, you know, you can't get away from that. That's part, of, that's part of this business. So for that reason, knowing that, and knowing how people, how buyers act, and people, and the fans and stuff, right, it was quickly decided as soon as I got home that I made everyone swear to silence about my injury. I, I told Hilda, and I told everybody, I said, listen, we cannot let anybody know how bad this is. Because if we do, we're not going to get hired anymore for two reasons. Buyers will hear that I'm in this bad of shape and go, well, he can't put on a good show anymore. Or they're going to say, we don't want it. We love JP. We don't want to put him through coming here to play while he's in that kind of pain. It's a real thing. That, that was a real serious consideration. And I know it's real because I've seen other people fall ill and hurt themselves and all this other stuff. And they and if they let it out, if any if they tell anybody what's going on, they just fall off the earth because nobody wants to be involved with, you know, serious physical injury or illness with an artist. It's just very, they they everybody gets really freaked out by it. I had to play a square dance <laughs> at the Normal Way Inn in Marguerite. It was one of the places that. I played a lot in those days, and so we started trying to figure out how the hell this was going to happen, because I could barely walk or stand, and so we went, I think Hilda went to town and bought this really big black neoprene uh, back brace, that had belts and straps and pulleys and everything else. And we, and we, she brought it home and I put it on and it 
didn't quite do the trick. I could stand up okay, but I, I, I just, I had no core strength anymore. If I sat up straight in a chair, I would tend to fall forward. I just couldn't hold myself up. And so I said, well, we got one that's going around the back. This one, big one, right? Go back to the pharmacy and buy another one. So she did. And so we put one the right way with, with all the stays and everything in the back. And we put the second one on backwards with the, with all, and, uh, and man, we cinched that bastard up so tight. I could barely breathe, but, uh, it, it gave enough compression and support that I could stand up and walk with, I think I was on crutches, pretty sure I was on crutches. And so we show, we don't say anything to anybody. We just, we show up at the dance before anybody gets there. And I wore this big baggy black shirt over, over everything. So you couldn't see anything was going on. And when we got there, uh, a couple of buddies of mine helped me get up on the stage and they put me in the kitchen chair. There's an old wooden chair you sat to play in there, sat in to play and they took black gaff tape and taped me into the chair. Just one strip around tight so you, you really couldn't see it because it was black and I was in black. The lighting wasn't the best and on the stage and, I, and that's how I played the dance and nobody knew that I was taped into the fucking chair. And... Boy, it was hard because I almost pissed myself over the night because I couldn't get up and go to the bathroom. I just stayed in this chair all night. And after everybody had left, I, you know, cut the tape and, and got down, get to the, went to the can, and, and we went home. And so that was my life right up until the first part of November was putting all these braces on. I finally graduated to a cane and which I absolutely, I, and I, when I walked into places, I tried my best to kind of walk like I didn't, that, that, like the cane was just a prop. You know, when nobody was looking, I was leaning on that bastard all, everything I had. And so, some tells me that Along about that time, you know, like Hilda, she didn't really go, I don't think she was really playing with me at that point. It was just me and the guys. She kind of drifted out of the band, I, guess, I, I think, if I remember correctly. She just wasn't there. And so that's how things went for, from, you know, the, about the 12th of August until Remembrance Day. November 2009. Uh, it was a it was a bit of a nightmare, you know, and I had to play all my shows sitting down, which was drawing some questions and stuff. And it's just like, you know, what's 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 going? On? And people ask me, "Are you okay?" I was like, "No, I'm fine. Just gonna whatever." And uh, I managed to keep it quiet, and, and it was it was well over a decade before anybody ever found out what had happened to me. Before I finally let it out that I I have I I played for basically the better part of uh, seven it was seven or eight months. It was well into the spring of two thousand ten before I even laid in a bed, I was still using the cane, uh, right up into March, you know, February, March, nobody knew. And it was a, it was 10 years before it finally got around that I had done, I had done all this work, you know, with a broken back braced up 
you know, it was a fucking nightmare. And, but I was happy to be working. I was lucky that I was able to keep working. And I think I only kept working because I played it the way I did. I, if I had, if I had come out with my difficulties, I think at the time, it would have spelled disaster. So we jump forward to Remembrance Day, November 11th, 2009. Uh, huh. This will be one of the uh, most, uh, I think, delicate uh, part of the story because... This was the the day the marriage ended, and what put myself and and Hilda on the front cover of Frank magazine, and a whole just a whole. It, it was it was the catalyst for everything falling apart. And so it's going to be difficult to tell this story. I want to tell it in a way that's, uh, that shares, I feel should share the blame for what happened. And although I didn't initiate it and, and it got way out of control uh, way faster than I wanted it to or thought it would. But, you know, the law became involved, and once that happened, things went south, especially for Hilda. It, and it was, it was unfortunate, but I think it both, it freed, it, it did, it ended the marriage and uh, freed us both. I think that in, in the long run, I think that Hilda is was is happier now and was happier, you know, shortly thereafter when everything was over with because we just weren't compatible. We we never were. And I think we loved each other, but we just weren't compatible. And we were both too goddamn stu stubborn to walk away from everything. The marriage, the business, the house, the money, all the stuff. We worked hard for it. She did work hard for it. She was a tremendous musician. But we weren't compatible. And so on November 11th, early in the morning, about 5 o'clock in the morning, the end, the real end of everything began. Uh... And it's actually, when I look back on it, it's pretty unbelievable that, again, something that happened that I never thought a million years could happen to me happened that morning. <sighs> and I guess that's life. Shit happens, and you don't see it coming. And I never saw this coming. At all. Really. In my mind, maybe, the back of my mind, maybe I thought, yeah, potential is there. But when it actually went down, it uh, threw me for a loop. Thank you. 
Anybody for a dill pickle?